Okay. There you go. Look All right. Back. Great. Okay. So as Brent mentioned, I've been working with uh, mostly table grape variety trials at Thanksgiving Point, where we have a half acre uh, cultivar trial there. With uh, We've got about 25 different varieties in it right now, but we haven't gathered data on some of the newer varieties that I've added over the last uh, two or three years. So that this uh, trial, which uh, and kind of mirrors a little bit the one, the, the demonstration that's up at the uh, Botanical Center in Kaysville, where there's about 40 varieties of grapes. Uh, this is a replicated trial where we're actually gathering harvest data and looking at uh, evaluation, evaluating the uh, uh, survivability, uh, the overwintering. So, and hopefully my camera's okay. So looking at, hold on a second. There we go. Okay, so uh, USU also has a bunch of other grape growing resources, um, grape trellising and training basics fact sheet, um, grape vine management, uh, grape varieties for Utah, uh, which um, I updated just this last year with new information from our trial. And then we have a YouTube channel as well. So there's, a, there's other good resources out there and more publications are coming out about um, grape vine management uh, for Utah. I also work with the wine grape growers in Southern Utah, I've been asked to help fill that need down there. And so I, I work with uh, the wine grape industry there, but th they're growing different grapes than what we would grow up North uh, as far as um, species. They're growing the vinifera grapes, which we're typically growing the hybrids. So <clears throat> for as far as just quick overview on grapes, uh, they tend to be deep rooted plants, except in the clay loam soils, they tend to be rather shallow rooted. But if you have a sandy loam, uh, or just a loam soil, they can be quite deep rooted, but they tend to root out um, only about as wide as the drip line will provide information or provide um, a water to the width of that. So they, they typically only root out about two feet wide. They're relatively tolerant of saline soils, but when I say that, um, they're still not super tolerant of it. They're, they're just more tolerant than a lot of our other fruit crops, um, particularly a lot of the other small fruits uh, like raspberries. Uh, as a woody vine, it can live for many years. Um, typically, growers expect that the woody vines that they're creating with their grapes will, will produce for about 20 to 25 years. Uh, but there are much longer um, production orchards. There's, there's lots of examples of orchards, um, both in the United States and in Europe, that have been in production much longer than that. Uh, they need a strong permanent support and they typically have a low fertilizer input, but that may or may not be the case um, depending on um, the soil type and how much they are uh, being cropped. We find that a lot of the varieties um, need chelated iron and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. So uh, we typically fertilize the grapes uh, at about um, 20 pounds of N per acre as it's just a general replacement amount and then we base uh, more on, um, we can do leaf cult, leaf tissue testing and stuff as well. And then um, we put iron on, as I mentioned, we like to use the EDDHA iron, which is the only one that's really effective in Utah's high pH soils. Uh, we put it on um, every spring as they leaf out in our, in our trials. And what we found is that the grape varieties that we're trialing from uh, that have come out of Minnesota and um, Wisconsin breeding trials um, tend to need this uh, supplemental iron more. They, they seem to, to not tolerate the higher pHs as well. And it could also be a function of soil type where, it, where the, the, our trial is in a heavier soil, uh, more of a clay loam soil. So but we, put, we put it on all of our cultivars just as as a treatment, and then we just evaluate those that don't respond completely to that one treatment. So as I mentioned, I, I work with the grape growers in Southern Utah and the varieties of grapes that they grow there are similar to what you'd find in many parts of California, particularly the Lodi, California area, um, as well as parts of Washington and Oregon. Uh, this is the European wine and table grape, and it's, it's a semi-hardy grape. Um, and it has the characteristic clean skin or where the, the, the skin doesn't come off the flesh easily. So that your Thompson seedless and a lot of the wine grapes that I mentioned there is popular varieties. 
Um, Mayor mentioned um, phylloxera, uh, the root insect, uh, being a problem on grapes. Uh, it's, it's primarily a problem on vinifera. Uh, the, the grapes that have a lot of American genetics or the American grapes themselves, like Concord, which is 100% of American species, uh, they are not really affected or bothered uh, to, to where there's significant injury from the grape phylloxera. Um, it's, it's mainly the, the Vitus vinifera, which has not adapted to phylloxera as a North American um, insect pest. So um, other types, Vitus labrusca, which is what Concord is. This is an American bunch grape, extremely cold hardy, um, but with a slip skin. So that's why it's more preferred for juicing. It also has seeds. And it also came up in the earlier discussion about um, grapes that don't ripen completely in the cluster. And you can see in this Concord picture here uh, on the right that there are, if you look at the, the one big cluster there on just on the right of the center of the image, you can see that there are unripe grapes there in that cluster. And this, this is a problem for Concord, particularly we see this more with the Concord than anything else. And uh, really, I think it's mostly just a function of letting uh, some of the clusters get too big, um, that these aren't herbicide injured. All right. Um, so as um, I know that there was a question asked, and I can just answer it before I move on about putting the iron on as a, a powder or a drench or as a foliar spray. I do a drench. Um, I know a lot of other growers will do a foliar spray uh, of a different iron chelated product. I, I do a drench. I, I like the fact that it, it can be active or available to the plant uh, in the soil throughout most of the growing season. Uh, and uh, it's actually less labor intensive for us to put it through um, either the drip system or um, just as a bucket application or something like that um, than trying to, to, to do a spray. So that's what, that's what we do. So then there are a number of hybrid grapes and this is mostly what we find in the marketplace now. And a lot of these um, can fit under the French American hybrid group. And this is where um, the, the French back um, a couple hundred years ago when um, the powdery mildew diseases and phylloxera were introduced to Europe and France, uh, nearly wiping out the wine industry there. Uh, the French were the most proactive at um, breeding uh, some of the wine grapes there with American species to try and get uh, genetic resistance or genetic tolerance in new grape varieties to, to the mildews and to grape phylloxera. And so these are still prevalent in, in the industry today and becoming more so as time goes on. They tend to be uh, hardy or, or uh, more hardy than the vinifera alone. Um, they're quite a bit more insect and disease resistant. Some of these are slip skin, some of them are clean skin. Um, or non-slip skin, and those are the ones that people typically prefer for table grapes. But um, the, it's just a little bit hit and miss in the breeding on, the, on those as to what characteristics they're gonna have. So some popular varieties include some old ones like um, Cannabis and Reliance, um, but some newer ones uh, include Jupiter, Vanessa, and Valiant, and um, those have all done well in our trials. And pictured here on the right is um, Jupiter, which is uh, one of our best performers in the trial. Uh, let's see. Um, and then there are the, the hybrid wine grapes and which are kind of the black sheep of the wine industry. And um, it's interesting that, that the wine industry, a lot of winery owners don't, don't have a lot of good feelings towards these grapes, but I think it's mostly centered on marketing. Um, that people haven't heard of, of the types of grapes and the wines that are made from these grapes. But that's changing. Uh, that's, that's changing rapidly as, as there's, there's a worldwide murmur more and more um, about the, the unsustainability of the traditional wine uh, grape uh, growing uh, inputs. They take a lot of inputs in pesticide um, sprays particularly uh, and uh, disease sprays. And so there, there's a growing, a growing movement and interest in um, these hybrid wine grapes being more sustainable long-term because they are more genetically resistant to a lot of pests and diseases. So they're crossings of vinifera grapes with various American grape species, so Vitus labrusca, Vitus riparia, Vitus rupestris, uh, and Vitus estivalis. Um, and a lot of them have very complex parentage as well, where they include maybe more than one 
um, grape species cross. So they can make good wines. Um, there are a number of them out there. I have a few in my trial um, and I'm actually adding some more to those as well. But um, these, are, these are wine grapes that have long been used in um, the Northeast, uh, yeah, the Northeastern part of the United States and are, are making um, some influences in other parts of the world as well. So uh, there are several breeding programs that are contributing to this. And, and some of these programs are also producing table grapes. As I mentioned, um, the Arkansas program is not only producing wine grapes, but also table grapes. Uh, so Marquette, um, Frontenac, La Crosse, Brianna, Aromella, Enchantment, and Opportunity are some uh, good ones that are fairly recent, uh, La Crosse and Brianna being um, quite a bit older, but La Crosse uh, has been a kind of one of the anchors in the hybrid wine industry. So Minnesota, um, Cornell University in New York, University of Arkansas, and then Elmer Swenson, who was a private breeder, uh, who worked a little bit with the University of Wisconsin, um, who, has, who, who is no longer alive, but has, has left a huge influence on the hardy wine grape industry. So as far as training systems go, I mentioned that most grapes need um, uh, a, a sturdy training system. Most cold, cold hardy table grapes are best on, on what's called a, a Munson or a modified Munson training system. I'll show, show a brief explanation of what that is. And most cold hardy wine and juice grapes are best grown on a top wire cordon training system. And this just has to, ref it mostly reflects um, the type of vine that they are, whether or not they're, they're very procumbent or downward growing, uh, or they're more upright um, in habit. So the modified Munson system is, is basically a system that's good for hand harvested table grapes in, in temperate climates, which is what we are. This is the pop, most popular version uh, in the Eastern and, and Northern parts of the United States. Uh, it offers good light exposure and it's easy to, to spray if that's necessary um, and good cluster access for harvesting. But with all, all grape vineyards, um, it typically takes um, a lot of cost to put in these trellises and, and this, this, this is a three-dimensional trellis, which, which is a bit more expensive. Um, the growers that I work with typically budget about $30,000 per acre for infrastructure on grapes, uh, including the plants, trellising, wire, irrigation system, and so on, and labor to install it. These are also labor-intensive um, systems, especially for table grapes because of shoot positioning. Um, and having to tie the, the canes to the wires, at least initially into the season. So um, that, that's kind of how that they work, kind of creates a three-dimensional um, canopy high in the sky with the, the modified Munson. Um, the top wire cordon is, is similar, but it doesn't have the extra wires at the top. Uh, this is used uh, primarily for the hybrid wine and American juice grapes in cool climates. So this would also be uh, a, a pretty good uh, system for Concord, um, the downward growing cultivars or the really rambling cultivars. Um, these are typically used with um, short cane or long spur pruning. These are easily mecha mechanized. So for wine and juice, we don't care that if the, the grapes get damaged when they're harvested, that's pretty normal. Um, but they're not suitable for vineyards with, with severe winter injury because of the long time it takes to reestablish the cordon. So the only way we would know if these systems would work for any particular grower in any particular situation would be to, to trial those in that particular area. So um, just kind of just a little bit of diagrams on how those um, systems work. So the top wire cord I'm looking at it um, from a side view just shows that um, the fruit is going to be born right near the top of those wires. Um, which is great for mechanical harvesting. So uh, the, the industry typically uses end posts that are about six inches in diameter if they're wood um, or the modified uh, sections of drill pipe or things like that are also used very creatively with ground acres or some sort of bracing to help keep the, the wires from collapsing uh, or the posts from collapsing from the weight on the wires. So the line posts are used um, typically about every 20 feet and a lot of growers will actually put a T post um, at every plant um, to assist in training as well. 
So I've got a picture here that won't go away, but um, so H bracing, uh, ground anchors with diagonal wires, as you can see in this picture here on the right, the big picture, you can kind of see here the wires that are moving down and anchored into a cement block. And then uh, at Thanksgiving point, we, we use basically just a bilateral cordon system, which is kind of in between what most of these grapes like because we've got several, lots of different kinds of grapes. And so we just had to pick a general purpose trellis. So we do have a three dimensional trellis with a line post every 20 feet uh, to keep the wires separated and from sagging. So as I mentioned, uh, a lot of growers will use metal posts. Um, this is an example here of one of the vineyards in Southern Utah where they, they use, um, they're using a small metal stake at each plant for training, but then they have a line post um, about every 20 feet that's metal. And they, they overall prefer the metal ones down there. Uh, the wire that is used is a high tensile 12 and a half gauge or heavier wire. This is not the what normal hardware wire. This stuff is very rust resistant and very resistant to stretching and has a break strength of around 900 pounds. So um, it's very durable. Uh, a lot of times this wire will outlast the trellis system itself, the posts. And then some sort of tensioning system to, to keep it tight. Um, spacing, I get a lot of questions about um, plant spacing uh, and the training styles. Um, but generally for table and juice grapes, um, these, are, these tend to be a lot more vigorous than most of the wine grapes. Um, these are gonna be around an eight foot spacing between plants and then about eight to nine feet between rows, as you can see here in, in this um, illustration. I think in this picture, we probably got around 10 feet between rows, but... Um, and then with wine grapes, um, overall, a lot of the wine grapes are less vigorous or they're not allowed to produce as much fruit, so they're kept smaller. Um, three to six feet between plants in the rows and eight to nine feet between the rows is pretty typical. So, and here's, here's um, this, is, this is just wine grape example of this, how uh, here the wine grapes are, are about four feet apart, just for comparison. So as I mentioned, we uh, use drip irrigation and uh, they do well with this. Most uh, growers, all the growers that I've worked with and everything that I've seen where your grapes are irrigated, uh, they're drip irrigated. So the pipe is usually hung on a low wire, 12 inches above the ground. And um, this, this helps the pipe be out of the way for cultivation and weed management uh, in the rows. It also helps us to see when the drip irrigation um, emitters get plugged up so we can replace the pipe or the section of pipe that we need to. But this is actually pretty common practice to see the wire elevated. Uh, what this picture is of here is pre-installed emitters. Um, this is a NetFM uh, pipe system and you can see the, the hard water deposits around these emitters uh, spaced every 12 inches. Uh, a lot of the commercial growers like to install their own emitters. Um, and not have them pre-built into the pipe. We irrigate uh, during the growing season about tw uh, twice a week for 90 minutes in a clay loam soil. Uh, but but uh, with, with table grapes um, in a sandy soil, they'll need water more often, but less for less time. So for wine grapes, they typically get um, quite a bit of water, uh, maybe a weekly watering um, until they go into veraison, which is where the fruit it starts to sugar up and then they're allowed to be stressed out. So they do a more of a deficit irrigation uh, later in the season. So here's some user installed emitters here where they actually have installed shutoff valves so they can um, stop the flow to individual areas or increase it if they need to. So the great cold of our trial, we started in 2014 uh, to evaluate cold hardiness and harvest potential. Um, there's a half acre planting total in four parts. Um, we have 21 cultivars that we're gathering data from currently, but we have an additional about four cultivars um, that we're waiting to get big enough to, to uh, take harvest data on. Uh, it usually takes three to four years for us to be able to, to get any, uh, well, at least four years to get any useful harvest information. So here's just some of the results of, of our trial. Um, looking at the number of plants that we planted and the, the number that have survived, um, 
some of them haven't performed as well as others. Um, but we look particularly at, um, at Edelweiss here at 62% survival. Um, and then we've got Marquette at 50% survival. So the, these again, uh, and Swenson Red at 64%. These, these again are, are great cultivars that were bred uh, in the extreme north. And um, we just think that they're just really struggling with, with the clay loam soil that the trial has, that we have in, in the trial. So because cold hardiness really shouldn't be an issue with any of these except for Thompson seedless and it, it's actually doing quite well so um, for us. But what most of you are probably interested in is um, the harvest data and some characteristics and the harvest dates is an average it can be plus or minus two weeks um, last year it was a little bit earlier than than most of the average here because um, we had the extreme heat. Uh, for a long period of time and it kind of moved things um, up a little bit for us but um, basically um, when you look at the table grapes particularly uh, and even some of the wine grapes um, they have a lot of potential for pretty heavy yields um, frontenac here in the middle as a wine grape whoops uh, uh, estimating about eleven thousand pounds per acre that's five five and a half tons per acre um, most growers won't actually crop their wine grapes to, to that many tons per acre. Uh, you, usually five is considered um, really a really heavy crop for, for wine grapes and four is, is more like a typical goal there. When we get into the juice grapes like Himrod and Jupiter and Marquis down here at 21,000 pounds per acre, I, I was kind of astonished when we, were, when we crunched the numbers on this. Um, but in looking at um, data and harvest um, numbers that have come out of, say, Michigan, which is a great state for growing a lot of table grapes, um, they're, they're actually, they actually see these kinds of yields, um, eight, nine tons per acre, uh, pretty regularly on their juice grapes. And so um, I, I, I think that's actually really great that we can potentially have that kind of harvest potential here. So... Um, what we're also measuring is, um, you know, fruit size, and you can see that some of these plants have very small fruits, like Frontenac is a very small grape, but that's typical of wine grapes, um, about 0.8 grams per berry. But then we get into um, like uh, Alden, which is four grams per berry. Uh, you get into Jupiter, which is 3.8 grams per berry. These are large grapes. These are naturally large grapes and uh, just huge variability in size. One of the things that we also measure that that uh, helps us to quantify when when they're ready to harvest is um, the bricks or the sugar content. So we we use a a, a bricks meter uh, to uh, to uh, kind of give us an idea of when of when they're getting close to harvest. And we also taste them and make sure that they're good. Uh, but uh, you can see that um, not all of them are are super sweet. Uh, Marquette is really sweet. It's like it's like eating candy. It's a very very sweet white grape, uh, very high bricks content, um, and it would get a little higher if if we let it hang a little bit longer. Uh, but most of them are in the mid uh, low to mid twenties um, in their sugar content, and that's pretty typical um, for juice grapes and for wine grapes. Uh, we have not been measuring pH in the wine grapes. That's uh, something that I'd, I'd like to start doing um, just because that's an important measurement for anybody who's looking to grow wine uh, or to make wine from their grapes um, because you need to have a low pH uh, or it won't store for, for, for you. So we're looking for the pH in wine grapes to, to not be more than about three and a half, pH of three and a half. So the top producers, um, and we're just looking now at, at average harvest per plant, Marquis at 31 pounds, Himrod at 24 pounds, and Jupiter at 21 pounds. And I promote Marquis and Himrod are as good replacements for Thompson seedless um, as they are hardier and they also tend to be a lot more productive in our trial um, than Thompson seedless. Um, Jupiter has been a great one. Uh, it tends to have a long harvest window as well as a, a seedless table grape that would also be good um, for uh, a kind of a Concordish flavor um, juice as well, and it makes great raisins. A lot of these grapes will make um, excellent raisins as well. Uh, as far as the seeded cultivars, um, those that would be for wine in the case of Aromella and Frontenac, 
um, are about 16 pounds per plant. Uh, and that's actually um, right, right on the money for um, a typical wine um, grape. That's, that's really nice for a wine grape. Um, and Valiant, uh, which is more used as a juice grape, a seeded juice grape, is about 19 uh, pounds per plant. Uh, those that didn't do so well, as I mentioned, the ones with the iron chlorosis um, was Bluebell was the worst. Um, Alden, Beta, and Bluebell had good survival, but really struggle with, with iron uh, issues. Um, probably more, and, and talking a little bit with the, the researcher at um, Minnesota that, that's working with their wine industry up there um, also seem to confirm that it's most likely the clay loam soil they're just and the, and the high pH uh, that they're just not used to, to working with that since these grapes are uh, selected in areas that have um, much much lower soil pHs than we have here. Uh, Swenson Red, um, we, we've had several plants die rapidly in the middle of the season uh, from some root rot diseases uh, again, most likely tied to the fact that we are growing in a, in a heavier soil. And, and I think this is relevant because in a lot of areas in, in Utah where we have a season uh, that can handle grapes, um, we don't have necessarily really loamy soils or sandy loam soils. A lot of us do have to grow on uh, more of the, the clay loams and the loamy clays. And so it, it's important to kind of understand this, that not all the varieties are going to do as well. Uh, in those kind of environments. And then Marquette and Delaware and Edelweiss, um, they had poor stash, establishment and survival. We, we lost um, about half of the Marquette and Delaware and 62% um, of the uh, Edelweiss or 62% survival of the Edelweiss. So again, um, primarily wine grapes bred in much different um, soil situation areas. Um, the lowest yields were Alden, uh, Delaware, and Edelweiss, um, and, and Swenson Red. Um, out of the three of those, out of the four of those, I was surprised that the vigor was so low on um, most of these because they were generally noted to be very vigorous plants, except for Delaware as, as a primarily a wine grape. Um, but again, um, it's really probably coming down to the fact that the, the soil isn't um, optimal. Um, not necessarily a problem in, in a given area, but they were for us. So better soil, do we need to increase plant density to get harvest yields up? Or how do we increase um, and, or change the vigor, um, fertilization, those kinds of issues. So we haven't investigated any of those at this point. So um, I don't want to... I, I want to keep an eye on my time and maybe uh, we can get back to answering some of the questions. Um, I don't know, Brent, do you want me to, as the moderator, <laughs> you're in charge of this, I guess, do you want me to field some of the questions or wait till the, wait no, till let's, I'm... let's, we're, we're to the end of the time. Let's, okay. um, let's take questions. Let's take questions. And, and if you have questions related to any of those issues that he's got had there on the screen with fertilizing or, or irrigation or any of that else, um, go ahead and post those. There's a few here that I want to discuss in more detail and, and a point that was made um, regarding um, the iron chelates um, and the suitability of some for foliar application. You mentioned the EDDHA, which is really the most effective as a soil applied. Um, and, and Jody Gale, one of our other extension professionals pointed out that that's, there's times of the year when you can't use that as a foliar spray. You wanna explain that just a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's really just that um, because this particular chelate was designed to work in, in soils and, and keep the iron uh, available um, up, up in these high pH soils, keep the iron from being bound up by the soil chemistry. Um, I wouldn't recommend um, putting on any iron uh, or any foliar fertilizer product um, when you've got fruit developing or present. So th this is all done pretty early in the season. Um, before before you have any of those kinds of issues, because um, you'll, it, you're spraying basically salty substances on the plants, and uh, we don't want to ever get get that onto the fruit. So, um, so, so just I'll add something in there too. Yeah, please. One of the nicknames for EDDHA iron is red iron, and it's almost like 
red spray paint and it stains whatever it comes in contact with, including you. Um, and so that's one of the big reasons. There, there are some um, chelated irons that are better situated for a foliar spray. There's one called yellow iron and I can't remember what the chelating agent is. One of the other questions was, what's an organic alternative to EDDHA if there is one? Um, I looked at the OMRI page and there's a whole page of iron chelates. I don't know, it, it, the, the labels don't tell you which, but a lot of those are formulated better for say a foliar spray. Yeah. Um, one, one point I would make is that if, you're, if you can use something that's chelated for soil applications, it tends to distribute through the plant better. If you're doing a foliar spray with iron, uh, I've heard some of the consultants call it spray painting the leaves green because it doesn't move into the buds. It doesn't really move into the fruit. It doesn't distribute through the plant nearly as well as a soil applied. But if you've got an issue, uh, certainly those foliar applications can be a good rescue. But the other point I would make is a lot of times when people run into a problem and are trying to rescue their plant, the label rates are for maintenance, not for rescue. And oftentimes, if you're trying to rescue a, a chlorotic sick plant, the label will say, you know, three pounds to the acre or something. And that's great for maintaining it. But if you're way behind, you're going to have to bump that dose up. I don't know if you've seen the same thing that that that, that rate just won't bring those really sick plants back where a, a heavier rate will. Yeah, no, that's 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 exactly what we've seen. And and that red iron does stain like crazy. Yeah. Um, I know that the yellow iron that they do as the foliar sprays is is a lot cheaper than than the red iron, which is a much more expensive chelate for some reason. But but the yellow iron won't do much when you put it on the soil. No, it's pretty much bound up and, yeah. and it doesn't do much. And and uh, I yeah, I think that uh, usually with the grapes, with um, the uh, soil application, uh, one 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 drench application. Yeah, in the spring, just around bud breaks, um, seems to pretty much um, cure cure it all. It, it does a great job for us. So um, here's a, a good question: How can you find out which way to prune a table grape? For example, Hemrod <laughs> Juniper Reliance is it spur prune or cane prune? How do you decide which system works best for which variety? <laughs> the, that's a great question. Um, do, the the best way to answer that is to um, probably have you trial it yourself, uh, test yourself to see what it is. There's no, there's no real good book that explains, explains this. I, I actually just um, have been uh, working a little bit too with um, the uh, viticulture specialist in, in Oregon, um, kind of looking at trial, uh, doing some trial studies on, on trellising and pruning styles for wine grapes. And uh, she's, she said it's kind of come full circle where a lot of the growers have been doing cane or spur pruning with their wine grapes. A lot of them are, are going to uh, cane pruning on a lot of varieties um, because they've actually been able to find that they're, they're getting better yields when, when the status quo has been to go with um, spur pruning. And so her, her advice was basically just try, the, try different methods in the area that you're at and see which ones give you um, the best yields for your situation. So there are some general recommendations and sometimes you'll, you'll see those on the like grower websites or nursery websites and things, but that doesn't necessarily mean it would be the best um, in your area. And especially we have to think about Utah being different in that our light levels are really high, our humidity is really low. So a lot of the reasons that sometimes these trellising or pruning styles are recommended in certain states are for disease management or um, dealing with low light issues and things like that where we don't have those same issues. So it's worth uh, doing some investigations in your own situation. Okay, There's, we've got a bunch of questions coming in here. So hopefully you can hop on the chat. One, one here is uh, Bruce says he bought a house about 10 years ago and there's two great finds. Um, how does he know, how can he determine what varieties they are? Yeah, there's not a real good way to do this. There are some fact sheets and things you can find on descriptions of, say, fruit and, and leaf morphology. So like looking at whether the leaf margins are serrated or lobed and those kinds of things. But those tend to be pretty subjective and grapes can produce, uh, one plant can produce leaves with different morphology. So it can be a little bit confusing that way. 
Um, so there's really not a good way, unfortunately. Um, UC, uh, University of California actually um, has a program called Foundation Plant Services um, that can do DNA testing on your grape plants. And, and they can, if, it, if they have the DNA in their database, um, they can uh, match it up or at least give you some of the parentage of the grapes that you have, but it runs about $350 a sample. Um, so it's, it's pretty expensive to do that, but there is some DNA testing available. Um, otherwise, it's just kind of comparing your plant to known um, characteristics uh, of plants that have been written about. So follow up, I assume they can come to Thanksgiving point and see the varieties you have and what those look like. Um, do you do formal field days or anything along those I lines? Haven't, I haven't. I haven't. That's probably a good idea. I haven't done it, but, but in lieu of that, what I have done is... Um, I put signs up around the property, uh, around the trial, and then there's also um, a name tag at each um, plant. So you can go and down there and look at each plant because the varieties are scattered throughout the trial. They're not all in one place. Great, thanks for that. So, so one question was, is the Sprint 138 the best iron chelate? We've talked a little bit about that. The EDDHA, um, a lot of those have 138 in the name. So it's uh, sequestrine 138, I think that, uh, Miller's Farrah Plus is another name, but again, that that's the red iron that's better for soil applied, and there's others that are better for foliar applied. So we've kind of we've kind of hit upon that. Um, so here's one for a backyard grower: Does using a vertical trellis affect production for table grapes? If you got less space um, for for the VSP trellis, would it fit in a smaller space to do a different type of trail system? What would you recommend there? Yeah, so v VSP is great. Um, a lot of wine grape um, growers do that for the more upright cultivars. And so um, I think making sure that um, you have a more um, upright cultivar rather than a procumbent cultivar is good to know, uh, depending on what cultivar you have. Uh, VSP is great. It is pretty labor intensive to tie the shoots up onto the vertical or it stands for vertical shoot positioning. So it's like taking the shoots as they grow and tying them vertically up the trellis. Uh, so um, that works well, um, trial it. You could, you could also use that same kind of wire setup. Um, it, VSP is set up for um, spur pruning systems, but you, you can use the same trellis system and go um, with a cane style without really changing the trellis. So I think it'd be worth um, building that system and then you can still try different ways to prune the plants in that system and you can still vertical shoot position them either way. Uh, where can you get some of the newer varieties that you are talking about? Would you, do you have? Yeah, that, that's been a little bit of a trick. Um, sometimes I've seen some of them at the local nurseries, but not too often. I'm, I'm trying to to get that changed, um, I order most of mine from nurseries back in New York. So the primary one is Double A Vineyards is where we found most of, uh, they're the most proactive in working with these different groups uh, that do the breeding work to get the hardy grapes in there. Um, so Double A Vineyards, it's just the word double and then the letter A and then vineyards.com. Um, they are bare root only, but they will, they do retail and wholesale. So um, there's still, I think you can still place orders for shipping in March and April of this year, if anybody's interested in looking um, at that. So one more question, I know we've gone way over, but we did plan on kind of keeping this lunch hour break at least uh, available to answer some questions. So I'm just keep going if you're available. I will I'm still say, available. If, I will say that if you have pest or disease issues, Marion had to jump off. She had to go guest lecture at class, but she... Her, her email is on the USU Extension website. Get on there or else sign up for her pest alerts if you want to get more information from her. Um, do grapes have any known beneficial fungal or bacterial uh, root zone associations? Is there mycorrhizae that you can inoculate grapes with or what, what kind of parameters do they so need? That, that, this is great. Um, I'm actually really happy to see this question. Um, I, I didn't know um, if they really did or not. But I, I talked to, as I said, I was working with um, the, the research, the viticulture specialist in Oregon, and um, she told me absolutely grapes form um, very good relationships with the native mycorrhiza, at least they have been in Oregon. Uh, and she said it's so significant that even on low phosphorus soils, growers rarely ever had have to add phosphorus because the mycorrhizal associations are very robust. 
So um, she she didn't uh, indicate that they that they inoculate anything, um, but but that they're just naturally um, abundant in the environment and and they're they're finding it themselves. Great. That's and you know I've seen situations in, in studies in other crops where a lot of times they'll get inoculated in the nursery. So if you're buying them from a nursery, there's already some of those associations that even if you don't have the appropriate uh, microorganism in your soil, a lot of it's coming with the, the nursery plant. So that's um, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, question on, have you tried Vanessa and your thoughts on growing Vanessa for Utah? So that's a good question. I didn't put Vanessa in the trial, um, but I have it at my house and it's killing it. It, it loves it. It's super vigorous. Um, I also have a clay loam soil at my house. Um, and it is it is really vigorous. Um, it's a great grape. It's a pink one, very crisp. It's considered the kind of the new top of the line variety for the red, if you like that red pink grape. It's a very mild flavor. The grapes are fairly small, which you could improve a little bit if you if you cluster thin or cluster pruned. Um, but it is it is quite a bit of a smaller grape. Um, so if you like that kind of more mild flavor that is a little bit more like what you might find in the red red flame kind of flavors, um, it's a great one. It, it honestly is, is is a really fabulous grape. I, I think that might be one that that's at Kaysville, isn't it? There is one of those at Kaysville as yeah. well. So yeah. you might consider going by the, the Kaysville demonstration planning there just as you go into the, the main entrance there to the Utah Botanical Center. There's there's a great planting there kind of on the hill and there's a bunch of them and Mike Pace is, kind of takes the lead on that. He keeps those pretty well labeled. Um, Sheridan Hansen is based right there and, and they can give you information on those, but there, there's some others you might wanna go by there and look at in, in midsummer. You can really see some differences in terms of yield, in terms of cane vigor. Um, so yeah, another, another great resource available to, to those of you that are looking at varieties. I think we've hit everything. The, the last question I heard here was more related to cane versus spur pruning and table grapes versus wine grapes. I think we kind of answered that before. Yeah, um, and I have in my yard, for example, I have Vanessa and Jupiter and I have spur pruned both of them. My Vanessa is really vigorous. And so I'm probably gonna change it over to cane pruning style this year and just compare the performance of it. Yeah. Um, so you can go both ways. You're gonna get grapes both ways. Um, it's how, how detailed you wanna get about tons per acre and all that kind of stuff. You're, you're probably not gonna see it a home, a home grower. You're probably not gonna see a whole lot of difference in um, productivity changes from one style over the other, to be quite honest. For as, as a home grape grower, I like spur pruning because it's easy to clean everything up. Yeah. And it's the more classic kind of that romantic yeah. look, if you will. So yeah. 